Hey there, and welcome to the daily podcast where wisdom smacks us with kisses or love taps. I'm Michelle Spiva, a wisdom strengthening coach, your host, and practical priestess of wisdom. Join us daily to gain wisdom and mental strength as we tackle innovative thinking, address emotional and behavioral life traps, and yes, provide you with some practical how-tos to wrap it all up. So settle in or crank up the speed 2x, whatever gets your mental processes firing as we dive in. Stay tuned. I don't mean to rush you, but you're still working on that? Can you give me some kind of ballpark of when we can expect it to be turned in? I I don't know. I, I just don't know. Sorry. Hey, this is Michelle Spiva, your Practical Priestess of Wisdom, and I want to welcome you to today's podcast of Wisdom Smack. So today we're going to be continuing from a little bit of what we left off on yesterday when we talked about stop giving up. Today, we're going to actually be talking about why you can't get anything done. Stick with me and I'll see you on the flip. All right. Thank you for joining me today. And let's go on and get into it. We're going to be talking about why you can't get anything done. And I'm talking to you guys about this because it affects all of us. And I know that I work through it um, all the time. It is my nemesis and I help others. And hopefully I'll be able to give say something to pass on to you and you'll be helped and maybe you'll help someone along the way as well. So Maybe I've mentioned this before, but as part of the disciplines that I use when working with people, whether it be life coaching, mental strengthening, uh, and back even in the therapeutic days, I use some of the techniques that I learned and uh, got certified in as a clinical hypnotherapist to help people to relax. And one of the main things that we depend on when trying to get people to get into a transitive state is to override all of the stimuli bombarding them for attention. And it always amazed me when it it usually used to be the people that were the most steadfast that I can't be hypnotized. And I would tell them, I'm not going to hypnotize you. You're going to do it. But it would always amaze me. The, The people who doff protest so much were the ones that were just the fastest to go under. And it, I started to, to learn and the more I practiced and, you know, the more I practiced the, how to do it, I started to learn that the more we're trying to use our mental energies to make decisions, to figure out things, to filter through and all of the bombardments that we have around us, the more stimuli we have, the easier it is for us to get into a hypnotic state and even go deeper and deeper because the brain is just like, yes, finally, I can knock this thing out and do some work. And it has not been conclusively proven that we have a finite number of inputs that we can handle in a given time period, but they are saying that it looks like each person has a certain amount of inputs and stimuli that you can handle before you zone out, before you just like, I can't take it anymore. (laughs) And you are just looking for a way to clock out. And so I wanted to say that because it ties into one of the big things that we're going to be talking, well, not one, it's going to be the primary thing I'm going to be talking about with you in our little chat today about why we can't get anything done. And that is the concept of decision fatigue. And what decision fatigue is, is more of this, where each day we spend some of this, these inputs that we are allotted uh, to make decisions. And because it's, think of it like a computer with processing slots, and there are only so many slots. And once the slots are filled, that's it. And the computer will just spin and spin and spin because it can't do, it can't use any more processing power to do any more tasks to the point where a lot of times it will just be like, shut me down and reboot me. And that's kind of sort of what we're talking about 
here. So it's like that when you reach that uh, point where your processing unit has been overtaxed and you, you need to check out. And it comes from having to make all of these different decisions about what you're going to do and how your mind splinters off and, and all of that. That's another reason while they talk about multitasking is not good, no matter who you are, no matter how great you think you're at it, it is not good because it drives you to this capacity of the amount of stimuli you have faster than if you would just take one thing at a time and concentrate on completing that task and then moving on to the next one. All right. So thank you for letting me get that out of the way to set this up. So now that we have a okay understanding of decision fatigue, I want to talk about two main things that go in hand with why we can't get things done when we're talking about this decision fatigue. First of all, our decision fatigue has become more prevalent and it is where it is becoming the norm with a large swath of people. If you think about how your day is going, just between the hours of waking and making it, if you go to a job, making it to your job, you have used more sensory inputs to make more decisions than the average person did at the mid part of the 20th century. Yes. Because if you think about it, you usually get up. A lot of times people turn that news on. They're listening to the news while they're getting ready. They're trying to decide what they're going to fix for breakfast, uh, what they're going to wear. If they've got kids, you know, looking at the time. If you got more than one kid, you got to figure out who has to be on the bus, who you have to drop off. Uh, and let's not even talk about your commute and, and how many decisions you have to make. So by the time you make it to your physical desk at your job, you're probably two thirds full of what you would normally like to use to have an optimal day of decision making. And it is not getting any better and it's not going to let up. And it means that we're going to have to figure out ways to become more efficient in our central processing unit, CPU. And to do that, they have been looking, they, meaning researchers, have been looking at ways to do this um, because it's not where you can stick another power stick in the back of your neck and say, okay, I increase my RAM speed, you know, to uh, 10x or whatever. And so in order uh, to do this, they've really been looking at how can we either chunk decisions together or alleviate some. And you might have seen this and uh, didn't know that that might be what's happening. So um, when I talk about some of the examples that are just staring us in the face, there are people who, who push the limits of productivity and peak performance. And uh, there are people who have a lot of responsibility on them at any given time. And so people who have made this famous for chunking their decisions down. People uh, who run large corporations, run countries and the like, you'll notice that they tend to wear the same quote unquote uniform every day because that is one of the easiest decisions that you can chunk down. So instead of having to figure out what am I going to wear today or you know, what goes with what, what color or whatever, you just have a standard uniform that's comfortable. And you can have it in t-shirts and long sleeves, and you can have just a range of colors and, you know, that just everything matches with everything. And you have eliminated a lot of decisions that you need to make. Uh, some people have the same types of food seasonally. So they always know, it's, it's this day in this season and this is what we have. And they run their lives like that. Now, I will say this, that when you look at uh, what to start eliminating to, to lessen some of the uh, decision fatigue, look at eliminating repetitive decisions that demand frequent attention. So look through your day and see uh, the, the things like what you eat and what you wear uh, that you can eliminate or chunk down into one, one category. Um, batching. That is something that I am trying to get back into. But when you know that there's something that you do every day, aka my podcast, it makes it where if you just chunk it into one lump 
um, area and get it all done, you can free up that time during the rest of the week to be doing other things or to give yourself a break so that you your, the other things that you do need to do in those particular days can go smoothly and you can do them um, with more attention and um, more effectiveness. And so those are some of the things that you can do with regards to lessening the de- decision fatigue. Now, there are some side effects of decision fatigue that they uh, that the researchers have noticed, and I will I, I totally am. I understand them and, and, and totally get it. And they talk about decision avoidance. And so I talked a little bit. I don't really talk about uh, romantic relationships on here because I'm really just trying to uh, serve the individual with giving you um, pieces of uh, wisdom that you can work on. But I, I did have a podcast where I talked about love bombing in the time of love bombing and the phenomenon of uh, ghosting people and love bombing them. You know, I love you and then I go away and then I hate you and then I love you and I come back, remember me and that kind of stuff. And what they're actually saying is, is that some of these people who are ghosting people in relationships, it's not necessarily that they're rude. It's not being rude. Well, they are. It's The act is rude, but they're not a rude person. And it's not necessarily that they are not good at relationships. It is more so that the relationships are past a distraction for the other things that demand their time. There are a lot of people who, and it's not just a demanding job. It is not that. There are some people that they don't have the luxury of having a relationship because of the familial responsibility that's on them. Uh, There are people who are raising uh, children, whether it be their own or family members' children. I know of a specific case of someone who uh, had an instant family of small children because a sibling uh, was incarcerated. And it takes everything they've got to do what they can for their nieces and nephews. And so because of that, they don't have the bandwidth to handle a relationship that requires too many decisions. And so uh, when looking at the ghosting situation, sometimes, and I don't have stats for this, um, I will just say that this was just, you know, by observation and and reading more into this phenomenon, that they are suggesting that sometimes when people feel like that particular relationship requires too many decisions, too much attention, that they fall into this decision avoidance where they're like, I can't handle this. I can't deal with this. And so they just ghost. Because even getting to the point of trying to explain why they can't handle it would cause them more issues with trying to live a life because then they would have to explain it and they're pretty sure somebody would try to talk them out of it and it gets to be a whole production. Am I advocating for that? No, but I am saying that because of all of the different stimuli and all of the different decisions that we live in that are not going anywhere, these are some of those um, emergent practices that are coming forth. We'll talk a little bit about that if we have time today. But if not, catch tomorrow and we'll we'll be talking about emergent practices. Uh, And it'll it'll make sense, okay? (laughs) So the next part of the side effects, so you've got this decision avoidance where people just, they can't make the decision. Or not only sometimes do you have people that consciously make, uh, avoid a decision, Sometimes you have it where they're unaware of the avoidance and they get stymied and they can't make a decision. They can't do anything. They become frozen, stuck or spinning around. Have you ever had it where you have all of these ideas, you know what you want to do. And when you sit down to try to do it, your brain goes in a kerfluffle and it betrays you. And the next thing you know, you are off watching um, a YouTube video in that weird part of the internet because you're like, I can't even focus. I don't know. Was this even a good idea? Should I? And you rethink everything. And that is part of that spinning about of decision avoidance because your CPUs have been all used up. And it's so funny how this old mother wit wisdom 
comes back. And now that we have even more uh, data and science, it explains it so much more. I remember my grandmother would be like, when you get to that point, you need to go take a nap. Go sleep on it or don't make a decision until you've had a good night's sleep and you will be able to think better and and see it in a better way. And that is exactly um, what they are proving with regards to people who are in severe decision fatigue. A simple 20 minute nap will help you to get more clarity and be able to make a decision. But that leads me to this other one. Now, there are many other uh, side effects of decision fatigue, but we don't have time to talk about them today. If you want to, just go and Google decision fatigue and and read up on it. I'm just trying to hit you with some uh, wisdom smacks so that you can be aware of this and help yourself, okay? So the other side effect that I wanted to talk about is a hampered or impaired self-regulation. And this goes back to um, not either not being able to, to make a decision or needing to sleep on a de- on 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 decisions they have attributed a uh, high decision fatigue to some degree as the fact that we can't sufficiently self-regulate, pe- uh, people are falling into uh, major personal and social problems, um, having impulse control issues, overspending, getting into debt, underachievement at work and school. That was part of the A part that I talked about, you know, missing deadlines when you you want nothing more than to hit the deadline, but you can't seem to get it together because you can't seem to make the right choices or you don't have enough power to keep yourself on track. And this is not about willpower, ego depletion, or any of that kind of stuff. This is not what we're talking about. What we're talking about is the fact that you're so fatigued and there is such a burden because of the everyday, day-to-day decision-making that impulses that you would normally be able to handle and catch, go unnoticed. Um, You drive faster. You uh, don't sleep as well. And normal things that you was, when you're well rested and and when you have the capacity to process, you're like, I can't believe I was doing that. You know, they even said uh, with uh, one research study that I looked at that it is been proven and I hate to say it but a lot of people already knew this that it's been proven that if you have to go before a judge you pray that you go first thing in the morning you want to be the first people because they genuine generally uh the the they said that they have found that there is a percentage the favorable uh rulings that a judge will make falls uh, anywhere around 65% to nearly down to zero by the end of the day. So you have a 65% variance on a favorable decision or a decision from a judge who is able to be uh, creatively engaged to use that bandwidth to come up with a judgment that is going to be favorable for you to help you out because it's just tired. And I'm not saying, and I'm not trying to give a reason for why judges behave the way they do. This is just based on a study that uh, showed this. And um, it was an amazing thing. Now, uh, that study actually came from um, the National Academy of Sciences uh, back in 2011. Yeah, because like I said, I'm, I'm very familiar with that one. And just <laughs> just looking at uh, the factors that go into judicial decisions, and they have a lot to do with the fact that we are human and that more and more people are under decision fatigue. And it could mean the difference between your freedom and incarceration in some cases. And so that is really important uh, that we look at that. But now that we've talked about that part of decision uh, fatigue, I want to get into, now that we know all of this, I want to get into what's that part that makes us makes it where we can't get stuff done. Because, yes, you can say, oh, Michelle, I, you know, I definitely have decision fatigue, but I still go to work. I still cook. I still take care of myself. So that's not the answer. And I, I'm, I, I hear you. 
And so what I want to do now, bear with me for the rest of this, I'm going to be talking about a framework that you'll find usually in technology, uh, um, agile, uh, lean, uh, not Six Sigma, but, you know, in, in some of those technical spaces where people have to deal with varying um, problems and figure out ways to get them solved. And so there is uh, this this gentleman, Dave Snowden, and he came up with a brilliant framework. It's it's simple. <laughs> and I don't, I don't even want to use that word because, but it is simple to the point of elegance. And he's Welsh and he gave it a, a funny name that uh, simply means to, uh, it, it means your habitat or your place, but it means to be able to occupy many places or belongings at the same time. And the, and the name is um, uh, Kyofin, and it's spelled C-Y-N-E-F-I-N. It's a Kyofin framework. And it's been around for over a decade, but it is, a, I think, a brilliant way to do a quick assessment when you're trying to self-diagnose and uh, figure out what is wrong with me? Why can't I get stuff done? So bear with me. I'm going to try to break this down in about five minutes. So he looks at it in domains. And if you were to make a cross on your paper and you would have, you would see you'd have four quadrants. But imagine in the middle where the cross, where the lines meet, that there are no lines. There's just this black little weird hole or tear in there. That would be one of the domains and it would be called disorder. Mm -hmm. And so in the middle is the land of disorder. Now, if you look at the upper left, that's going to be the land of complexity. The upper right is going to be the land of complication. The lower left is going to be the land of chaos or chaoticness. And the lower right is going to be the land of simplicity or obviousness. All right. And so this is just a fancy way of saying that. Looking at the situation that you are faced with and whether it be you're trying to do an achievement or you're trying to diagnose the problem or you can't move or or you don't know what's going on, you can use this because what this is, is this is a sense making model. It is set up to help you make sense of where you are. And so that's why I even mention it. And so quickly. Uh, when you think of your brain in terms of inputs and outputs and the drain on your CPU processing units, you're and and you're in this stymied area, you're right in the middle. You're in the land of disorder. Now, Mr. Snowden does say that this is where most of us are anyway. So don't feel bad about being in the land of disorder where you don't know what to do. And so what he says is when you're trying to make sense of things, he said, if something looks like oh, I've seen this before, and this is what I did the last time, you are facing something that's obvious, meaning that it is process-driven. Like, you see it, and now, because you can now see how you did something, you can put it in a category of how to fix it, and then you can act on it. So that would be in the obvious category. But if you're like, I don't know, um, exactly what's happening, but I notice that every time I do X, Y happens. Instead of being in the land of obvious where there's a process, you are in the land of complicated. <laughs> you know how they say it's complicated. Um, and how he says to make sense of that is what you want to do is think of it as an uh, something that can be analyzed. Like if you just take the time to do a little dig and a little analysis, looking for those patterns. You know, a lot of times I'm talking about analytical processes here. He said, if you do that, then you will be able to figure it out. Meaning that you get a sense of, what's the problem or what's going on or what you want to achieve. Then you do a little dig and a little analysis and all of that. And then you're able to act and fix it or, or achieve it. Okay. Now let's go back to our middle ground, our land of disorder. And if it's not obvious, meaning that you see it and then you're like, I've been here before and you are able to put it in a category and then you're able to fix it. Or you're like, okay, I see that this means that. So let me go and test some hypotheses. Let me figure this out. And then you figure it out. If that's not happening, 
then you're on the other side, you're on the left side. And um, that means that it's either a complex problem or you're in the land of chaos. And and thank y'all for sticking with me on this because I know I'm, I'm, I'm trying to break down some uh, serious uh, frameworks in about five minutes, but you, you with me. I know you with me. I can sense you're with me, but keep with me, okay? So if, for instance, you look and you're like, this is a problem. I see that it can be fixed, but I don't have the tools. Uh, I can't fix it by myself. So say, for instance, you um, have an exploding toilet and you see what the problem is and you're like, hmm, okay, I have no clue how to fix this, but I know it needs to be fixed. That's going to be where you are going to probably have to probe and, and figure out well, where's the water coming from? How do I turn the water off? You know? And and so you have to figure that out. And once you get the water turned off, then you're like, I, I can't use the toilet now. So I got to figure out what the next thing is. And so you're like, hmm, I need to find an expert to fix the toilet. So that means that now that you've gotten a sense of where the problem is, then you can act. So that's going to be a complex kind of situation. And then the Last one is chaos. And we've been talking about chaos a lot. Y'all see how I've been trying to bring y'all some cohesion here? Yes, indeed. So if you find that you're in chaos, that really means that you're in the land of, I ain't never seen this before. I don't know what to do. (laughs) You know, but you can actually uh, figure out how to uh, start doing something by just taking authority over it to get stable. And so for you, it would be, I mean, if, if you sense like, let me just get some stability and it means all, everything is out of disarray. And the biggest thing that you can do is to find a way to get some order. So say for instance, your house is a wreck and you come in like somebody has ransacked it and you're like, oh my gosh, you know, that would be chaos. That would be the domain of chaos. And there isn't a process. There isn't an expert that can come in. There isn't a way to probe and figure out, you know, well, why is my house like this? You don't have time for that. You are in chaotic Uh, domain and you need to get order. So what you do is you just start, you pick up something and you start picking up one thing after another, figuring out what to do with it, where it goes. And and then you return to order. And those are the different ways that you're able to evaluate what's going on in your life. Because once you can uh, figure this out, uh, if you're in chaos, If you're just having a simple complication or it's a complex something that's going to take more than you've got and you need a little help to figure it out, at least that gives you a blueprint for how to start going about moving towards getting something done. For some people, if you figure out that you've got a a complex situation, that means you need to see a therapist or go to the doctor or something. You need the help of someone who is well versed in that. Or maybe, If it's a complication, you just be like, I got to do a little bit more. I got to investigate a little bit more. I got to become an expert in this a little bit more. You see how they start to work to help you get a hold of where you are? And so what I want to say is, is once you're doing this, this is going to help you to figure out either how easy or how difficult the task is that you're trying to complete. And I want to say this, everything does not always have to be figured out the same way. Too many times, if we are used to being on that right side of the cross where that's in the land of order and we are process driven and we think that everything has a, uh, has a recipe to it, you're in trouble because everything can't be figured out by a recipe. Everything can't have a step action to it. Or if you think if I just, with enough time and enough analysis, I can figure it out. Mm -mm. No, no, you are not a plumber. You need to call somebody. You need some help. (laughs) Uh, But if you can realize that it's okay to be on the left side of disorder where it might be complex and it might be out of your scope and you have probed enough to be able to figure it out that I can't fix this and you're willing to go get the help then you can get this done. And maybe you need a team. Maybe you need to bring in a team to help you. That is a way to do it. And if it's chaos, you know, the first thing I need to do 
is I need to get some kind of stabilization. And once I get things stable, then I can move back to see if I've got a complication, a complex problem, or if now I'm in an obvious solution. And by doing this kind of stuff, you will get to the point where you're starting to make forward movement to be able to work some things out. And I'm going to say this, and that is when you are in the midst of figuring out that, oh my gosh, I can't get anything done. I've got decision fatigue. You can use this uh, uh, kind of fan framework to even figure out the things that you need to let go, what you shouldn't be concerned about, what you need to take back so that you can up your processing ability to handle your, you know, the life. You need to figure out what's mandatory and what's nice to have. And so it's a great way of getting you to realize that maybe everything is not as simple or even as hard as you might think. And it gives you a blueprint to help you to get past the fatigue of the decision so that you can move forward. So I want you to just realize that everything that we do, we've probably already done it. We just didn't maybe know um, the name, a a fancy name for it. But when you're able to put a name on something and and get it chunked together and be able to look at it from a 30,000 foot view, it becomes doable and you become the owner of it. So I want you to be able to own this and be able to start getting things done. And everything does not have to be reduced down to simple. There is a way to work with the complicated and the complex. So guess what? Yeah, my time is up. I thank you for yours. This has been Michelle Spivey, your practical priestess of wisdom with another podcast of Wisdom Smack. Love you dearly. Don't forget to check the show notes and um, share, like, comment. Use our Amazon link when you do your shopping. And thank you so much. I'll see you tomorrow. Bye. And that's going to do it for today's podcast of Wisdom Smack with Michelle Spiva. If you like this podcast, please help us get the word out. Like, comment, subscribe, and even share. And if you really like it, please help us continue to get the word out by considering using this show's link for Amazon. So when you want to go to Amazon and you do all of your general shopping, Uh, please use michellespiva.com forward slash AMZ. It's simple as that. It doesn't cost you anything extra. And this show might receive a little bit of commission that will go towards helping to further get these episodes out to you and to others. So thank you so much for listening. This has been Michelle Spiva with Wisdom Smack. Bye.